I want to ask you if there's any alternative to democracy. No one questions it. We're left as uh, victims to discuss the outcome. Well, we first of all, Morris, have to narrow down the term to modern Western democracy. <laughs> I think democracy in Athens, in Greece, once upon a time, uh, was something different. Uh, today's modern democracy uh, is built on the foundations of a model of a state called the secular state. And it separates religion from politics. And uh, it uh, identifies the individual as the unit of the state. And therefore, it is the individual who makes a choice and expresses that choice in what is called elections. This is the recipe for the destruction of the group, the tribal relationships that the Lord who created us gave to us. That we bond together in groups and in tribes, nations. And that bonding together is a form of social cohesion. And so it is the group which should express itself and make a choice collectively. And within the group, the process of debate and consultation would take place. And when the group has made a decision, then the leader of the tribe or the chief would express on behalf of the tribe or the group the decision. This form of democracy allows the tribal relations to remain intact. And unless you have these tribal relations, <laughs> unless you have the groups which remain together and have a common bond of elementary loyalty to the tribe and obedience to the chief of the tribe, society can be endangered. Society can begin to unravel and you can end up with a jungle of beasts. What the modern political democracy has done with a system of elections in which the individual is the unit of the state is to preside over the destruction of those social bonds of cohesion. And so we are witnessing now the dismantling of society around the world. Wherever the Western system of democracy has been... NATO is waging war on many different fronts. One of which is the destruction of traditional society around the world so that society can be absorbed into the global society being created by modern, what has become of modern Western civilization. And then NATO has another agenda, taking control of the resources of the world and then using that for blackmail, oil, for example. And then the third agenda is using their military power to advance the monetary agenda of creating one money for the world and that one money would be bogus and fraudulent, not gold and silver coins, no. And then they use their, their military power to wage wars, 
to advance Israel's goal, let me say it one more time, that it was a monstrous lie on the part of those who introduced the cause of a state of Israel in the Holy Land and who pleaded for that state of Israel to be established a Jewish homeland in the Holy Land, the Balfour Declaration, that all that we want to do is to create a home for a people without a home. That was a monstrous, blazing lie. They know it. What they wanted to do, and they're still pursuing it, is to create a state of Israel that will eventually claim to rule the world. And when that Israel claims to rule the world with what I call Pax Judaica, but there's no Pax in it at all, then according to our eschatology, and back again, I'm at eschatology, a ruler will emerge in Israel who will claim to be the true Messiah. But Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, said, while describing that man, who would be a Jew, who would be a young man, who would be powerfully built, who would have the curls at the side that the Orthodox Jews have, and he would not be the Messiah. Rather, he would be the false Messiah, the Antichrist, or Dajjal. So NATO is waging war on many different fronts, one of which is a military front to advance the agenda of the state of Israel. Morris, I was of the opinion that the Zionists wanted a Romney victory in the US elections. And if they had gotten a Romney victory, then he would have waged Israel's wars for Israel without any hesitation. In the last interview, I mentioned to you that the film on Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, was hatched somewhere in um, California and released on the internet uh, just before 9-11. It appears to me to have been produced and, and, and released at that time to inflame public opinion around the world of Islam and to present, with the, present the American voting public with images of angry Muslims around the world, which would have played into Romney's agenda that you need a president who is strong enough to teach those radical Muslims a lesson. And I then said that if uh, this film on the Prophet did not deliver the job and uh, Obama's ratings did not start to fall dramatically, then the Zionists would probably have an October surprise up their sleeves. I think it's too early for us to be able to say whether or not Sandy was an October surprise. But I'm conscious of the fact that Prophet Muhammad, Allah's blessings be upon him, did warn us that the Antichrist would have control over the weather, that he would cause the rain to fall and stop the rain from falling. And he would do that in pursuit of an agenda of supporting those who followed him and punishing those who did not follow him. And so I would not at all be surprised to learn that we now have man-made hurricanes, man-made earthquakes. And the Sandy was meant to be an October surprise to give the edge to Romney. But it's too early, and we do not have the evidences yet to be able to say whether or not Sandy was an October surprise. But if my 
analysis is correct that the, the, the Zionists preferred to have a Romney victory. And the American voting public, despite uh, the colossal damage in New York and New Jersey, went out and voted and gave Obama uh, re-election. The implication could be that there are indeed limits. <laughs> limits to Zionist capacity to control and to manipulate. And I mentioned in previous interviews that Western man is now waking up. And one of the greatest dangers that the Zionists can face in the world would be from within Western civilization. If thinking people and articulate people waking up to, to the ride on which they've been taken and now seeking to extricate themselves from that venomous embrace. So if we are correct that the Zionists wanted a Romney victory and instead got an Obama victory, the implication now would be that the pressure would be on Obama to deliver because surely he must have made promises. Give me some time until elections. Give me some time until elections. And if he does not deliver, then the writing could be on the wall and we'll have another JFK on our hands. I hope it does not happen. But I'm sure Obama knows the danger that he now faces. I mean, I can see the, the desire and the need to create chaos through the weather. That is a very profitable um, in itself, regardless of its influence on the on the elections. To to constantly create chaos throughout our societies is just a given part of the agenda that we're living under. Well, that um, reminds me that part of the process through which we can get evidence that this was not an act of nature, is to do what should have been done after 9-11. If the number of Jews who are involved in Wall Street in the financial world far outweighs their proportional representation in the, re in the population, then the number of Jewish fatalities in 9-11 should have been significant. If 3,000 people were killed on 9-11, what percentage of them were Jews? <laughs> In the process of doing this investigation, we probably learned that lots of them did not go out to work that day. Similarly, in the case of Sandy, if someone could make a rounds of the insurance companies, and find out how many people took out insurances that were suspicious prior to Sandy and are now reaping the benefits of foreknowledge of what is to come. We'd be then be able to get concrete evidence, significant evidence supporting the thesis that Sandy was more than an act of nature. Yes, indeed. You, you, I'm amazed at your insight into the darker side of the world and how it works. But uh, I, absolutely, uh, the, the, I think it's impre impregnable you, you, to access the uh, type of information you're suggesting, insurance policies, etc. I mean, we're, we're, you're, you're at the kernel of the gangsters there, you know. Um, you know. I believe that... Obama has bought, had bought time for the U.S. dollar. And the time is now up. Whether it was Obama or it was Romney, time for the U.S. dollar is up. And so the immediate future is one in which we should not only be looking carefully 
at signs of a military attack on Iran, on Pakistan, on Syria. But in addition to that, that we monitor very carefully uh, the likelihood of a monetary collapse um, that will bring the monetary system to an end and have it replaced with a new monetary system. Uh, Dr. Mohammed Mahathir, the former Prime Minister of Malaysia, recently wrote a piece on his blog I don't know why it's called a blog. Where did that word come from, blog? I, I have no idea. Yeah. On uh, the subject of quantitative easing. Quantitative easing. QE. That there was QE1, QE2, QE3. And he <laughs> explained in his simple language with his tongue in his cheek, that you no longer have to print paper money. It's a cumbersome process to print seven trillion dollars. What a lot of paper, what a lot of ink, printing presses, and then the armored car cars and the security guards to transport all of that. You're printing paper and making money, which is bogus, which is fraudulent, but also cumbersome. And what they're doing now, he says, the Western world is taking the rest of mankind for a ride, for the last ride, really, monetary ride. That in 2008, coming up to now, to 2012, they stage all of this monetary fiction about banking system being in crisis with stories stranger than the story of the cattle the cow that jumped over the moon so that the federal reserve could just write a check that's all you just write a check for the seven trillion you don't have to print the paper anymore and have that sent to the banks when it reaches the banks, it is still not yet money. No. It is when the banks lend that and people borrow it and there's a legal contract to return, then it becomes money, part of the monetary system. And so what the U.S. government did in handing over huge sums of money to the banking system in QE1, QE2, and now QE3 around the corner, was massively fraudulent and bogus. And it is in the nature of the world created by Almighty God. The lies cannot, uh, lies cannot remain forever. But that which is false cannot exist forever must one day collapse and we are now on the verge of that collapse there's no way under the sun that the u.s dollar can survive it's gone it's finished we're just waiting for the moment and that moment could now come after the elections when some act of terrorism or war takes place like an Israeli first strike on Iran, the use of tactical nuclear weapon, and uh, Wall Street will then take over, and that's the end of the U.S. dollar. The sad thing that I have to share with you, Maurice, is that my critics are so fierce in criticizing me and using the basis language that they can find against me, plastering it on the internet and proclaiming themselves to be the most pious and the most rightly guided Muslims.
<laughs> and yet there's scholarship. That Islamic scholarship out there. Up to this day cannot recognize the monetary system of paper, plastic, and electronic money to be bogus and fraudulent and haram and to be a carefully constructed vehicle of exploitation and oppression and enslavement of the masses. I don't know what else I can do. I've been working in the field for so long to try to teach and to explain my Muslim people, the scholars of Islam. But I fail. I have failed. We have a conference coming up on the 26th and 27th of November. And I was hoping that you would be able to attend it um, on riba. Uh, usury, borrowing and lending on interest. And in that conference, we're going to be spending a lot of time on silver. But maybe silver has a more important role to play at this time in monetary history than gold. But without the support of the scholars of Islam, we're just whistling in the wind. So yes, I want to share with you my view that we are on the verge of the collapse of the monetary system now the elections are over. And I also sorrowfully so that the world of Islam is unprepared to respond appropriately. So some, as an observer, the world of Islam is not uh, well balanced at this time. Uh, it's the same with the West. Um, you, you mentioned Dr. Mohammed Matir, and uh, there was an Asian crisis similar to what just happened to Iran, where the currencies crashed many years ago when he was in power. And he, he refused the IMF loan. That's right. He was the only country to do so in Asia. And uh, it worked. It, it survived very well, Malaysia. What is interesting, Dr. Mahat, um, what is interesting, Maris, is that he had a minister of finance named Anwar Ibrahim, who had been recognized as the great Islamic hope. He was a very vibrant Muslim youth leader in the country as a young man been nurtured to grow, to represent Islam as an Islamic leader. And he was finance minister. And he, he appeared to be more of a blue-eyed boy of the IMF. Whereas Dr. Muhammad Mahathir, who was secular, secular nationalist, never grew a beard and put on a hat and appeared to be an Islamic scholar, no. Dr. Mahathir consistently, consistently demonstrated a superior understanding of the gravity of the monetary problem and the dangers posed by the IMF. And it is Dr. Mahathir now who is claiming that the Western world is taking the rest of the world for a ride with the QE, the quantitative easing. Did you just write a check? for $7 trillion and send it to the banks. And the, re the rest of the world is saying nothing about it and doing nothing about it. And the scholars of Islam and the leaders of Islam would not stand up and say the simple thing, that this money that we are using is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's haram. We should return to dinar and dirham. That's, that's all that they have to do. And they can't do it. They can't do it. No, nobody can refute the system, not even people like Russia or China, who you would expect have the strength to do so. Nobody is able to reject this, this laissez-faire capitalism, this free trade, whatever you want to call it, globalization. Oh, we are a people, Maurice, who insist on the establishment and the preservation of an absolutely free and fair market. Absolutely free and fair market. 
Islam. A man came to the Prophet, Allah's blessings be upon him, and said, O Messenger of Allah, prices are too high. Please impose price control. The Prophet said, No. The man came back a second and a third time pleading. The Prophet said, No. He said, But we can raise our hands and pray to Allah that he can bring down prices. When prices are high, the farmer benefits. When prices are low, the consumer benefits. So one day for me and one day for you. You don't stop buying because the prices are high. Because now that the prices are high, he is going to benefit who is producing the food. This is the extent to which we value a free and a fair market. Our market is one which does not discriminate between the Muslim and the non-Muslim. All come into the market as equals. And if a Jew in our market is selling at a better price, demonstrates greater integrity, and delivers superior quality of goods, we buy from the Jew in preference to our Muslim brother. Because there is no brotherhood in trade. Trade must be free. Even when war takes place, we do not use trade as a weapon of war. Economic sanctions is something filthy in Islamic ethics. Trade war is something filthy in Islamic business ethics. You are allowed to trade with the enemy while war is in place, going on on the condition that you do not trade in weapons of war. Trade is supposed to benefit mutual, mutually, all parties involved in trade. So we are a people who insist upon establishing and maintaining a free and a fair market. But that's not a fair market where money is corrupted and paper becomes money, bogus and fraudulent. And so we are asking to return to integrity of money. That money must have integrity. Money must have intrinsic value. And if only we could get the scholars of Islam to wake up to the massive fraud is taking place. But they hurl all kind of slander against me. They use vicious language against me. They call me all kinds of names. And their scholars have eyes and cannot see, have ears and cannot hear, have hearts and yet do not understand. They're worse than cattle. That's the state of the world of Islam today. None of us can get along. I'm, you know, um, in the sanctions you mentioned, there's economic sanctions being imposed on, on Syria now. It's a good example. And now there's a humanitarian crisis. I mean, the sanctions actually hurt the poor people. And they're in used Iraq? to... In Iraq? In Iraq. The world knows about it. The people who are administering the sanctions, they themselves knew it. And they talk, spoke about it. But that did not affect the bloodthirsty Zionists who were only after the blood of the people. It is, it is something shameful. It is disgraceful to use trade as a weapon. Islam, the religion, will never disgrace itself the way modern Western civilization has disgraced itself in using trade as a weapon and in imposing economic sanctions. They are a absolutely shameless people with no morals at all who could impose economic sanctions. Absolutely. Well, I'm a very satisfied man. I've had a very good education here. 
I'm not sure where to go, where to take it farther, though. Well, I think we've had enough for tonight. Yes. I thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you again.